what kind of illness. These diagnoses vary as widely as the psychiatrists who make them. In this hidden camera footage, a person visited several different psychiatrists complaining of the same symptoms. I'm extremely unorganized and I didn't used to be. It's caused problems in the family. It's caused problems getting, you know, I'm, I'm self-employed. You've got ADD, ADHD, you depressed, and your depression is back over the breast. If you have a brain chemistry disorder, it's probably genetic. You have a lot of the symptoms of depression. So it seems like it is a mixed picture. What that means is like we got some depressive symptoms and some, you know, high symptoms. So. If you're bipolar, I'll need to give you a mood stabilizer. Mm -hmm. I, we don't know, I kind of doubt it. It's considered low grade bipolar. You are more of the ADD than the ADHD. And as far as medications for depression, because I would recommend that you start a medication which are Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil, Celexa. Usually your popular XR is pretty good. I'll give you some uh, Lexapro in the morning and some Trazodone at night. Lamectal is a better medication for that. It works on your depression also. And, but the treatment for any bipolar cycling is the uh, same. The lithium. Remeron is another one. Trazodone. Segretol. Lipogood. Lobotrin. Lexapro. Lamectro. Equatroid. Depocro. Lithium. Ambien. You may need an antidepressant also with, uh, with your Lamectro. We don't know if I give you a medication, if it is going to work or not. And to a certain degree, it's uh, trial and error. You never know if it's the right drug. How many people have I cured? Well, uh, there are no real cures right now in psychiatry. I have cured none of my patients. We're always challenged by our lack of knowledge. I mean, in fact, we don't know what the causes of mental illness are. Most mental illnesses, we do not know the cause. And of course, it would be nice to know exact reasons of disorders, but maybe in the future. I'm the uh, director of research at the American Psychiatric Association. We don't know the etiology of really any of the mental disorders at the present time. DSM-5 is coming out. It's grown to 10 times its original size and it labels everybody. I could find five diagnoses that fit, would fit you or anybody else. Compare this to the research methods of pathology, a real science that discovers real diseases using a wide variety of precise diagnostic tests. We do millions of laboratory tests as well as the structural examination and the microscopic examination. It's um, a whole series of applied scientific procedures. In, in the case of, of psychiatry, there isn't any uh, laboratory tool that can precisely identify a psychiatric disease and allow it, allow it to be classified. It's not as if there's some study of tissue or some study of the body or some study of matter. These are all uh, categories which are made up. They're simply made up. They're not, they don't exist in nature. They're uh, decided upon by psychiatrists and voted on. Psychiatrists are not the only ones who benefit from the DSM. Wherever you find a psychiatric diagnosis, you'll find a psychiatric drug. The pharmaceutical corporation now contribute enormous sums of money for the education of psychiatric residents and for the support of research by their professors so that psychiatry today has become very, in America, has become very largely uh, learning of which drug to use with which disease or disorder. We need to make sure that we understand the very close interactions among the American Psychiatric Association with its DSM, the pharmaceutical companies who love the fact that every time there's a new edition of the DSM, there are dozens more categories in there. And so more conditions for the drug companies to say, oh, we've got a pill for that. In 2006, a study revealed that 56% of all psychiatrists deciding what disorders to list in the next DSM had financial ties to at least one drug company. Today, we see the consequences a barrage of drugs, each one targeted at an invented disorder that is backed by an arbitrary diagnosis found in the DSM. The fact that it is couched in the language of science without, again, without necessarily having any of the scientific data or, or underpinnings to justify it, 
is as threatening as anything we've seen today. And psychiatry's latest and most expensive ploy to fool the public by imitating legitimate medicine? Brain scans. We can scan all the brains we want to. The fact that we see changes in different people's brains, changes in functioning, doesn't mean that we've discovered anything that has its origin in the brain. It just means that we're seeing changes, but it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the brain. Psychiatrists and psychologists use the DSM to label 450 million people worldwide as mentally ill. A total equal to the populations of France, Italy, Germany, Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom and Russia combined. While sales of the psychiatric drugs they push have topped 27 billion dollars annually, funding from world governments for these patients gross psychiatry 440 billion dollars a year. And much of this money comes from the diagnosis and drugging of our most trusting and vulnerable. swallowed all manner of poisonous certainties fed us by our parents and school teachers. If the race is to be freed from its crippling burden of good and evil, it must be psychiatrists who take the original responsibility. Brock Chisholm's declaration typified the psychiatric onslaught aimed directly at our school system. They actually said that the purpose was social control. Not to pass on knowledge. Not to give him something so that he can go into the world of work. In 1950, psychiatrists and psychologists from around the world met at the White House to propose a total reorientation of the public school system. The White House Conference on Mental Health in the 1950s was a landmark that served to bolster the idea that schools would serve their communities better in the, as mental health clinics than they would as uh, institutions of learning. In the early 60s, the world of psychiatry started to really go places in this country, little by little. It came into our schools, our educational system. And by 1965, it was written into law. Psychiatrists were given the green light for the wholesale labeling and drugging of school children. A child is labeled ADD or ADHD the minute he can't uh, sit still for a well, 10, 15 minute period of time, uh, or he talks constantly or ignores the teacher completely, that will get him and earn him an ADD or ADHD label. The labeling of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, went into full swing in 1987. Within one year, 500,000 American children would be diagnosed as ADHD. By 1994, that number had soared to 4.4 million. In response to widespread public alarm at this apparent epidemic of mental disease, the U.S. government-funded National Institutes of Health assembled a panel of prominent doctors and psychiatrists to explain to parents and educators exactly what ADHD was. I would like uh, any member of the panel to describe uh, a typical ADHD in terms of symptomatology. Mark, would you like to, since you see them in your practice? There, I mean, I think the panel has been frank, and, you know, the difficulties here are immense in terms of, of uh, um, these, I mean, <clears throat> ah, it is hard, it's very hard to know how to answer this question. There, um, they cannot, you know, even when um, uh, they are as if driven by a motor. There are some good clinical descriptions. Um, and I think, you know, we, uh, I, I do, I think 
the part of the problem is the profession keeps changing the diagnosis. At this time, we do not have a diagnostic test for ADHD. Therefore, the validity of the disorder continues to be a problem. But this shocking admission did not stop school psychiatrists. Two years later, the number of American students diagnosed with ADHD had shot up to six million. Today, 20 million children worldwide are labeled with some form of learning disorder, a diagnosis often made in a matter of minutes. We would sit behind um, a two-way mirror um, w along with the parents. We would then look at um, the child. We would like do small manipulative activities with them to see where their deficit was. Um, it was wrong what we were doing. We were looking at a five-minute glimpse of this child's life and saying, okay, here you go. Here's a little pill. Take it. You'll be fine. Those little pills like Ritalin, Adderall, and Concerta are classified by the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration as highly addictive substances, right along with cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine. When I was on the Ritalin, it made me just feel like totally different, like I wasn't even who I was. I was, you know, flipping out, was twitching, you know, going crazy. I felt like I was out of it all the time, like I wasn't there, I wasn't human. You're just a zombie pretty much not you, you, you know you do what you can and just to get by and just don't do anything extra my mother never teased me but she thought i really had adhd and i was wrong and i had something wrong with me so i thought she'd feel bad and feel sorry for me if i died but then again i i thought that she um, would miss me a lot and i also love her um a little more than i wanted to kill myself and so I stopped, I stopped when I realized that. The abundance of prescription medications created a new income source for kids, selling their meds to their schoolmates. It's called Kitty Cocaine. They take the Ritalin and they just repackage it and they sell it on campus to the kids because it's like speed. I figured like if I was going to do drugs, I might as well make it worth it. And I ended up doing street drugs and then ended up getting into it really bad. We're looking at um, marijuana and other things as being gateway drugs, and actually the, the so-called medications are a greater gateway drug. The Ritalin drugs are backfiring big time because if the child is already disruptive and he takes cocaine, he's going to be a lot more disruptive after he's taken it. It is not going to calm him down. Boom, she got on the drugs and her personality changed, her behaviors changed, it became erratic and dark and violent and uh, it, it was just a nightmare. He kept having adverse reactions, becoming very, very angry. He could not control his behavior. He couldn't control his temper. He was on five different psych meds, Prozac and um, lithium and um, he was seven years old and he was unable to function. He would have rages and then crying and, and all kinds of um, just violent rages, grabbing knives and all of this. The list includes 15-year-old Kip Kinkle withdrawing from Prozac when he shot 22 classmates, killing two after murdering his mother and stepfather at his home in Springfield, Oregon. 18-year-old Jason Hoffman on Effexor and Selexa when he opened fire at his California high school, wounding five. 15-year-old Sean Cooper on a mix of antidepressants when he shot students in Idaho. And 17-year-old Eric Harris on Luvox when he and partner Dylan Klebold killed 12 classmates and a teacher in the bloodiest school massacre yet, Columbine. And all of this overshadows the very reason children came to school in the first place, to get an education. Since 1970, the United States has fallen from 9th to 28th place in worldwide academic standing. While during that same period, the number of American school children labeled with learning disorders has skyrocketed, and the sales of ADHD drugs have multiplied 32 times. Children don't ask for psychiatric drugs. Children don't ask to be diagnosed. They don't want to be called crazy. So you ask to ask the classic Roman question, legal question, cui bono, who benefits? The people who make the diagnosis.